I started, and I was a teenager, uh, with not much experience in music or musical instruments, there wasn't a lot around in rural Vermont, you know, where I lived there. I knew I needed to, I really wanted to do it, I really wanted to make instruments. And I discovered, amazingly enough, there was a lot of things that just fell into place. And I think in the local health food store, a little flyer for this guy, Charles Fox, who was, had a little school. So I learned how to build what would essentially be a kind of Martin dreadnought-ish, dreadnought-ish uh, steel string guitar. Dimensions, bracing, uh, variables that you might need to know. There's guitar building in this country, steel string guitar building, which is really the dominant instrument uh, that we're talking about here, um, is a factory model, basically. It was largely influenced, and all the hand builders are largely influenced by the factory model because it was Martin and Gibson and whoever else, but mostly them, you know, that built instruments that we are all emulating when we build traditional steel string guitars. So everything from the, the look and the design and the feel and the finish is all kind of based on how the factories built those instruments. You know, most builders, I would certainly say, establish a model. They'll tend to establish one or two or three, or maybe more, models and produce those. And then you jig up to produce those. And then any work that you do for a musician tends to be customizing those models. What I've always done is I've started it from scratch with each musician. Said, okay, what do you want? Uh, along the way, there were some wonderful musicians that really helped me kind of uh, pull all that together, make, do that. Um, he, it turned out, ended up going on to make a record, very nice record for uh, Wyndham Hill Records and became friends with Alex Degrassi and Michael Hedges and Will Ackerman, and that crowd, which a lot of people will be familiar with those names, because that was really kind of the beginning of the blossoming of the American acoustic steel string, solo steel string guitar tradition. Daniel would travel out to the West Coast and then would uh, come back and give me news of builders and people out here. But he was very influential because he was a great guitarist and really the first guitarist that I ever built instruments for, you know, where he would say, this is, this works, this doesn't work. I think there's going to be more of this, uh, more and more of this kind of combining of musicians and luthiers to create things. I see more and more of that, and I think that that is fostered by having this great community of individual builders who can work more closely with the individual musicians. What I think we're as kind of as a community of musicians and and luthier is kind of where we're going. What you know, what is the state? There's a lot of wonderful interplay between, you know, the factory model and the handmade model. And the two lines are kind of blurring, which I think is kind of wonderful. You know, we still have there's still the the really cheap instruments made by the really big factories. And there's always going to be a place for that. But there's now so many more sort of, you know, the boutique builders that um, make, you know, like Santa Cruz guitar that makes, you know, however many, you know, X hundred or a thousand guitars a year, but it's not tens of thousands, you know, they make 16 guitars a week or something, whatever it is. Um, so it's a little bit more production, but they're using the hand techniques and hand voicing and making great instruments for prices that are more reasonable than I can do. I haven't seen anybody else do this particular thing. It's a little bit similar to the uh, the um, work board, which is cut out like a guitar shape. It has slots in it, and they slide uh, things like this in and out from the sides. So I got this idea from uh, listening to a lecture that Jose Romanillos did, and he he had little L-shaped things that he slid in and out of slots. And I thought, wow, you know, I could make a big table that had these T-slots in it and then make these kind of uh, posts and just be able to slide them in anywhere. And otherwise, I'm mostly just building classical style. People are kind of always amazed by that. 
Harry Fleischman always cracks up when he when we talk about how I'm using classical techniques to build these 39 string harp guitars. <laughs> you know, and they can take something like this and just make a masonite cutout of it. And I can figure out where the doming I want. You know, it looks like the doming here was right there. And so I'll have that section will be uh, have a void underneath it, and I just screw that down to the workboard to get a doming. And you can adjust the doming for for how much tension you want in it, depending on how soft your wood is, or how big your instrument is, or what kind of sound you're trying to get. So there's a lot of parameters you can control with this. Uh, a lot of people these days are just doing their doming. They just have a, especially in steel string guitars, you just have a, a dish, right? What they call a radius dish with a whatever it is, 15 foot, 24 foot radius in it. So you have a curve in the dish. And the top just gets pressed down into that and the braces are fit into that. Um, then every guitar is, has that dish. And this is really a different thing. It's more closer to the old uh, classical style where they would actually have a big hunk of wood and they would carve into the shape of the wood like a workbench and they would carve a little doming into the shape and kind of a much more complex shape and then force the braces into that shape. I've worked with a violin builder now for 30 years. The aesthetics of the violin building world are greatly, greatly different from guitar building. The violin building tradition is very much one instrument at a time, very handmade. The aesthetic is very different. You want to see tool marks in the instrument. You know, you don't, you don't want to see a Jeff Traugott guitar, you don't want to see a chisel mark in the top. You want to see that in violins. You want to see where somebody has scraped the wood. It wants to look like it was made by hand. That is the aesthetic. And Susie is always saying to me, come on, give it up, stop sanding, you know, use a scraper, you know, and <laughs> show some marks, make it look like it's made by hand. And we're always trying to make it look like it was made by a factory because that is the aesthetic that we were given as guitar builders. I think it would be great if we lost that. You know, if we could just get rid of some of that and not worry about trying to look like our instruments were made in factories, because we're not factories. So when I started out, I was doing uh, lacquer, acrylic lacquer, which is nasty stuff. Acry you know, it's not, and we think acrylic as being sort of a water-based art paint, but you know, acrylic, automotive acrylic lacquer is really nasty stuff. And then I moved to nitrocellulose lacquer, but I was living in this shop in the commune. Living in the shop, literally. I had a loft in the upstairs. We had no exhaust fan. I was spraying in the shop, out of, just spraying out a window, and then sleeping, spending 24 hours a day in the fumes. And I got really sick. And I can't open a can. I can't be around a can of a nitrocellulose lacquer. Can't open it. A friend came, one of my guitar building students, uh, came, he was just finished a guitar, sprayed it in his garage, and he brought it by to said, I want you to look at the finish. And I didn't think about it, you know, it had been curing in his garage for a while, hanging up, and he brought it in, and he wanted me to look, you know, see, you know, what do you think it's finished? And I was holding it up, looking at it, and I that close to it, just the gassing off, and I just started to lose it. And I said, you know, we got to go outside. And that night I had the most intense headache, gut pains, sweating. It was just horrible. I just can't be around that stuff. So I switched to water base finish, and uh, of which there's many waterborne finishes now. And I did that for quite a few years. And I never liked it much, but I was less sensitive to it. And then I slowly got sensitized to it. And I got to the point where if I wore enough gear, I could spray and not get sick. But I couldn't have them gassing off in the shop. I couldn't be around it. I would spend, so I would, my process of rubbing out is very convoluted, you know, and I would use micro mesh uh, sandpaper and did it all by hand. Take me about eight hours to do the final rub and polish for an instrument. And I would have to do it with a, a um, forced air respirator, you know, breather on in order to be able to not get sick. And I just, after a while, I just said, I can't do this. What am I going to do? And I didn't want to use oil for the tops. I use oil for the back and sides, kind of an oil varnish, which I'm not that sensitive to. So I finally uh, decided I needed to do French polish. 
and French polish doesn't bother me much. The alcohol, alcohol is gassed off overnight. You know, you can French polish, put on five or eight or ten coats in a day, and the next day the alcohol's gone, you don't smell it. But it had, uh, has eight, a little section of harp strings that go, start there and go up in pitch. And the pegs were here, but I had, I had to redo stuff, it being a prototype, so I'm working on it. But essentially it's a banjo pot, and for this prototype I just used an old banjo pot I had, you know, an old something from the last century, and make, making the neck and peg head. The other thing that's interesting about it is that it's that five string banjo is typical. This has six strings, so it has an extra low string, which is really nice for a... Uh, and I'm doing this with nylon strings right now, uh, but the extra strings, the harp strings, will be metal strings. Eventually I want to do something where I have some, some bass strings too, some harp bass strings. And I'm thinking it's something which will be a, kind of a crossover that guitarists will, harp guitarists, because I have clientele in the harp guitar community, um, will be interested in. Uh, and so I'd like to add some elements that are more similar to some of the harp guitars that are being made. that I'm going to actually make a few of these and make it something that's simple to construct and is enough like a five-string banjo that five-string banjoists could play it, but is interesting enough uh, that some of the harp guitar people will be interested in it too. We'll see. There's the bird clock. You should be glad that we don't have one of the motorcycle clocks that makes a sound of vintage motorcycles every hour. Or the train clocks. So here there's going to be uh, seven more pegs. I pulled them out. I had to redo this section um, for various reasons. <clears throat> there will be like this, uh, seven more pegs and seven more of these thin high strings. The idea will be that then I could have this fifth string on the five string banjo is just hit by the thumb and it's just droning, right? It's doing that all the time. But then you only have that one note to drone. So the idea was I could have a whole octave of, of uh, notes to drone on if I can train my thumb to hit them, right? Then the other thing is that you can also pluck those and do other effects with them. Turns out they're really cool, actually. I, I, when I had it strung up, it was just enchanting sounding, just really neat. Uh, whether the world will like it or won't be something that the world wants. At this point, I'm not that interested in that. I'd like that to happen, but I want to make one, make a prototype that I can use myself. Uh, it's interesting that now I've come to this point after all these years, you know, 40-some years, where I'm, I'm becoming more interested in just simplifying things. I always knew I was going to come back around to the place where I was doing this expansive thing again. Doing starting from art rather than starting from, well, what do I need to do to build a good guitar? Rather to come back around, well, I have this great idea for a guitar that looks like a chicken, you know, or something like that, and, and to be able to just do that and make it work. And so now, uh, 35 years later, I'm at that point, you know, where I basically can, I'm pretty secure about being able to design a guitar that looks like a chicken and make it work. I'm not sure that's what I want to do, <laughs> but you get the idea. It's just been sitting here for... Cut out 
bone needs rosin. <laughs>